architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try and have a conversation on contemporary architecture and contemporary architectural thinking and today I am talking to the well-known historian Jean-Louis Cohen. And if you have been following his work, you will know that Jean-Louis is a person who is not only prolific in his output, but is someone who has studied architecture at diverse scales and in diverse locations, including that of France, Germany, North Africa, the United States, Eastern Europe, and other related areas. With an opportunity to talk to Jean, I have taken this time to discuss uh, the history and trajectory of modernism, of modernity, as he sees it from a high altitude, with the idea of trying to develop a sharper, clearer picture of the import of modernity and modernism, uh, what it was, and in particular, what is it standing today, and what is it that we can learn about it in terms of our ability to understand the present and prepare for the future, in particular here in the 21st century. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I hope to do a lot more on this topic in the future. Here we go. Jean-Louis, thank you for having this conversation with me and uh, welcome to Architecture Talk. It's a pleasure to have you here and to uh, uh, explore what historiography may be all about. Uh, and, you know, as I was trying to get ready for our conversation today, of course, I, uh, I, have, I have your books sitting behind me over here, and, uh, and I did uh, try to see some of your recent talks online, and as usual, as usual, as everyone knows, you know, you are so unbelievably prolific. <laughs> It's, it's you produce uh, it seems to me uh, you know a book and a monograph uh, every other year and meanwhile you have exhibitions and meanwhile you have all these PhD students and then on, on top of that you were just telling me you're in south of France uh, and but you are teaching in Paris but I know you have a fabulous apartment in NYU in Manhattan and your work also you, you say in many ways deals with the kind of a transnational kind of a question, you know, there's always, you know, there's the French Algeria question, there is the German French tension uh, uh, and, and, and so on. So you yourself are kind of multi-placed and your work is interested in multi-placement, if I may say so this way, right? Uh, and uh, uh, why, why, why is that, you know? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Vikram, for having me in the program. I'm very yeah. happy to be able to continue in a focused way an exchange which, which has taken place in several places over the years. Yeah. So since you're uh, asking me about what seems to be perhaps not an obsession, or at least a concern for transnationalism and often binationalism, uh, there, there are probably uh, a series of reasons to this attitude of mine. The first one might be uh, a biographic one. I would define myself as a Parisian Jew on one hand, but also as a wandering Jew. So I have these mm-hmm. two aspects. I'm deeply a Parisian and a wandering Jew. Yes. yes. I'm deeply rooted in Paris. All my grandparents were born here from various sources. So for me, Paris is very... But you important. have some connection to uh, Casablanca, no? I mean, you're... Uh, no, no. You're, you're the, connection, the connection to, wrote a book. Yeah, sorry. The connection to Morocco is a scholarly one. Yeah. My, uh, I had Moroccan ancestors, but they left Tetuan, which was sort of transposition of Granada on African soil. Mm-hmm. They left Tetuan in the late... 18th century, so that's late 18th ago. century, or like 1790s yeah. or something like that. Yeah, I see. That's 
more than 200 years ago. So okay. no clear, um, uh, no clear legible connection to Morocco, oh. but an interest, an interest in uh, uh, perhaps also, and this is where this transnational question uh, becomes interesting. Uh, on my part, I think it's a reaction against the tired uh, opposition, which has been very often used in the writing of uh, uh, the history of architecture and of uh, other disciplines between international and national. The yeah, idea yeah, of yeah. a sort of international umbrella in architecture, yeah. the international congresses, and then the national, the national situations. Mm -hmm. And I'm more interested in, in what I would call the, the bilateral, the, 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 the connections between national scenes, uh, north-south, this is uh, France, Morocco and Algeria, France-south, but also south-north, as the colonial experience right. had, had an impact yeah. on, the, on the central state. So mm -hmm. south-north, north-south, but also east-west, uh, west-east. Mm -hmm. Between, uh, uh, of course, France and Germany, France and Italy, between the U.S. and uh, and Russia. This is my last big book on the on the Russian-American connection, which has been a, an, an extremely important one in the 20th but, but century. But why? What's the problem with the international-national discourse, from your point of view? This kind of discourse doesn't take into account how uh, uh, architecture and culture operate. Architecture yeah. uh, and culture operate. In a, in a porous manner yeah. uh, through the construction of ideals. Yeah, Architects, yeah. but also intellectuals at large construct ideal scenes to which they relate. And these ideal scenes are, can be very close. I mean, French uh, intellectuals reading Nietzsche before 1914, it yeah. was very close, but it, it can be also very far away. Uh, yeah. Leo Trotsky reading Henry George and, uh, who had an impact on Frank Lloyd Wright in the US, which then bounced back into Russia in the, in the 1930s. So I'm interested in sort of worldwide uh, circulation of, uh, of ideas, of patterns, of, uh, uh, of themes, of, uh, uh, of discourse, if you want. So that's the wandering Jew in you, right? I mean, that's... And yes, the wandering it's... part is that it's, uh, I like to, uh, I'm, I'm still, uh, what I would say, attached to paper, to archives, to books, to journals, to correspondence, which is still largely on paper. And I, I like to get it where it is in yeah. remote archives. And also I feel, and this is the architect in me, but perhaps a difference in respect with historians who are only working on paper. Um, no. I, I, I feel I can only understand a situation if I uh, know the place, if I have a feeling of the place, of the setting, of the atmosphere, of the scale of places. Uh, mm. Otherwise, I think one misses uh, very much if uh, one remains on a completely book-based uh, type of knowledge. So you're saying this kind of uh, multinationality, transnationality, cross-nationality is is an important thing because it is actually a more accurate descriptor of how things go on in the world. Is that is that basically it? And, uh, yes, so that I think it's it, it's a more uh, it sticks very much to the way people operate. And even at another level, I would I would insist. And this was the core of the lecture course I gave this year at the Collège de France about what I've called transurban, interurbanity, or transurban. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, very often things are crystallized in, uh, in cities and in relationships between cities. Uh, London wanting to become Paris at some point, Paris want, wanting to become uh, Rome, uh, Rome right, wanting right. to be Rome wanting to become uh, Berlin. Uh, so I think we, we have seen many of these phenomena and they are still existing to this day. So mm -hmm. I've tried to map uh, in the case of cities, I've tried to map the connections between how this transfer be from city to city operate. They operate through representations, but also through factual, through empirical techniques, the transfer of particular forms of urban design, the, the uh, uh, deformation, the reading and the deformation of particular types of fabric. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So I think there are concrete, and there the recomposition 
of all these fragments into uh, into a, a different whole. So I'm, I'm really interested in how in the practical procedures of these uh, uh, displacements of urban of urban form. Right, right. Yeah. In fact, I remember in 1986 on my very first flight ever uh, on the way to the United States uh, was from uh, Bombay to London. And, and I was doing a stopover there and we were going to do the Eurail tour of Europe, but first stop was London. And I got into London and I was uh, walking around and I said, man, this looks like Bombay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, and it may sound strange, I don't know, to you, uh, but uh, so much of the, you know, the language of the train stations, the signage uh, of the subway, the, uh, the sense of order and organization. Of course, we know there's a colonial prehistory uh, that connects this thing, but there is this inter interaction, as you're talking about, interurbanity, intraurbanity, uh, whatever the term, this sort of things that go on. Uh, so what is your thesis there? Why is this the case? Is it the case of, uh, of desire? Is it the case of politics and power? Uh, 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 well, there are different aspects. I, I would put them on a look at them from the point of view of time. Uh, if you look at the uh, at American cities and the way we've bore, they have North American cities. Mm -hmm. And the borrowing have made of forms from pa Paris or Vienna at the turn of the 20th century. They yeah. were doing that because they were seeing their future. They were looking at these cities are, as their uh, necessary destiny. With Amer the development of the United States, we were thinking they would become like the old world and they mm -hmm. had to subscribe to the language of the old world. At the same time, uh, European cities were beginning to see in Chicago or New York an image of their, their own future. Yeah, so this is yeah. one attitude, looking at other cities uh, as expressions of uh, future. And this is the core uh, principle of Americanism as I uh, I've defined it years ago together with Hubert Amish and then on my own. So mm -hmm. looking at the future, but it's also, of course, looking at, at a glorious past. I mean, the, um, if you take the case of Rome, Rome starts by rebuilding itself after its own image uh, at the Renaissance. And mm -hmm. then you have other Romes. You will have a third Rome locally with Mussolini, mm -hmm. uh, Rome trying to emulate its glory, not it, its glorious past. So no, not looking at Rome as an image of the future, but looking at Rome as an image of the past. If you look at Petersburg, when Petersburg was created by Peter the Great, mm -hmm. the models were models of ancient or not so ancient, but anyway of previous European cities. So I think this uh, identification with other cities is, uh, uh, operates in the, on the scale of time, either towards the future, to, uh, uh, towards a desirable future, or, or to, to, towards a legitimate past. Right, right. And in many ways, the past as the future reimagined in many different ways. So I wonder if one can sort of pass this down a little bit more. And, uh, and if I can put, you know, two examples, which are close to me, which I know you are very familiar with also. I, I'm trying to set up a contrast, if there is a contrast between such a process in place in the making of Chandigarh, let's say, you know, as a, a post-colonial city, which is certainly, you know, looking at other places, there's all kind of referentiality there. There's all kind of transfer and movements of people. And we can talk a little bit about how that functions uh, in terms of this discourse that you are describing uh, mm -hmm. of movement of ideas. And I want to try and uh, compare that to... Uh, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, global architecture today, Dubaiification of the world, which certainly is an important thing going on in India and many other parts of the world. So uh, without any prejudgment, let's take those two moments one at a time. You did, uh, you, you, sometime back, uh, you had your zigzag discussion about uh, Corbusier's politics and, and architecture, and you sort of conclude that discussion. I'm sure you've published more on it, but... Uh, Around, uh, around 1950, 45, 50. Uh, we can get into politics later, but I just want to talk about this, this interurbanity. You know, so how does a place like Chandigarh 
in your conception figure in, in this in this kind of trajectory of inter interreferencing? Look, obviously, injected uh, in his uh, views uh, on Chandigarh, uh, a series of observations he had made in India. Uh, the observatories, the gardens at Pinjora, the articulation of, of Punjabi villages. So there was, as always, a, a component of local observation. Sure. But uh, there is, for me, a very interesting uh, sketch, not done by him. I don't think it's his hand. It's someone in the office with whom could be traced. But there's an interesting drawing in which he compares the plan of Chandigarh with uh, the plan of Lachians for New Delhi. Uh, in the, and, and there is a third term, a third term, which is the axis from the Louvre to the Etoile in Paris, the main yeah, axis yeah. of Paris. Yeah. yeah. So in a way, there is the idea that uh, a, ca a capital city is something particular. And I yeah. think Le Corbusier, who never really uh, worked on a, cap on, a, on a capital city, ab initio, ab from the beginning, yeah. the white sheet tries to look to understand the scale of Chandigarh as the scale of a big capital. So there is this mm -hmm. aspect. And the other one is, of course, is well known. It's the recycling of the Garden City uh, based uh, Albert uh, Myers, plan Albert. Of, Meyer, of Albert yeah. Meyer, which is different. Yeah. So in a way, uh, Chandigarh merges two, uh, two, two systems, the system of the capital, the system, the collage of neighborhoods of post-war Urbanist, which Le Corbusier uh, readjusts and read, reads and readjusts in his own way, and mm -hmm. then the grid, uh, the circulation grid of a famous seven, seven ways, seven roads, which he had been working on since the uh, since the war. So it's a, a sort of, um, as always in the work of Le Corbusier and of many other architects, it it is a, a sort of vertical collapse of a series of layers which have different types of determinations. Yeah, it's kind of a palimpsest, if you like. So it's the layering, it's a layering, because uh, the palimpsest is, is, is based on the ground. Palimpsest needs a ground. It's, it's, it's more layering. It's more, uh, if you want to uh, uh, compare, uh, uh, I, I would use a term from pastry. It's not, it's more a Napoleon or a millefeuille, uh, a kind of pastry in which you have layers and layers of puff, puff pastry. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, with layers, uh, uh, with uh, intermediate layers of cream. So uh, <laughs> it's more, it's, uh, where is the cream? Where is the, where is the pastry? Where is the is pastry? Where is I, leave, the cream? I, leave, I leave open. But. <laughs> and then there is icing on top of the cake, which I mean, the, the parallel could work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we could spend a lot of time figuring out which is which. So I guess my the question is, so are you, would you argue that this process, this layering of the pastry that is Chandigarh in Kabuzia's sort of uh, reconceptualization of it, is this part of the general trajectory of uh, intercity referencing or is this a particular moment? You're talking about the, the Chandigarh episode? Yes. Or, yeah, I'm, t I'm saying the Chandigarh yeah. episode as Kabuzier, as the process that you described it. Uh, is this a particular technique to Kabuzier, or is this, as you are arguing, this is how, how cities work? This is how it is done? I don't think Le Corbusier is dif uh, any different from other uh, city makers. If you, uh, I'll take one example on which I have worked. Uh, well, let's take the example of. Uh, a uh, famous one, which is Haussmann's Paris. Mm -hmm. Haussmann, Paris of Haussmann, uh, which is not composed by Haussmann, but rather by the by Napoleon III, by the emperor, who had a mm -hmm. really uh, good uh, knowledge and an interest in city matters, can be seen as combining uh, the idea of uh, uh, large thoroughfares, large, large roads open in existing fabric, as it had been done in, uh, in Rome at the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. So there is a Roman component. Mm -hmm. And there is also, and this is really important in the, on the part of the emperor, an, an interest for London. And the, the grid of public gardens uh, is clearly inspired by London, where the emperor had been in exile before 1848. Sure. So you meet Paris. The, the Paris mo model, of course, and there, there is also self-referentiality to, to previous uh, uh, moments in the history of Paris. 
but you could say that it's uh, generated by both Rome and, uh, and London. And then, of course, the Parisian model can be exported and trans transformed in, in many ways. If now we, uh, and there are really interesting processes by, by which models can be inverted. Uh, I'll take another European um, model of the 19th century, which is a fascinating one. Uh, when in 1862, the big expansion plan for Berlin is made by James Hobrecht, who is also a bureaucrat like, um, uh, like Haussmann. The model is, uh, is Haussmann, but it's a sort of inverted Haussmannian pattern, a system of streets and squares, which was used inside the existing city for Paris becomes a system ensuring the regular uh, growth of Berlin. Mm -hmm. It becomes an expansion system with the same devices. So um, uh, I think that, uh, I don't think that there's a, that, that there are cities that are pure invention, perhaps in the mind of, uh, uh, of writers like Italo Calvino, uh, of course, but uh, uh, but but even in the case of Italo Calvino. Oh yeah, they're uh, layered. Where, Calvino um, cities are layered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. yes, but there is a very interesting passage in the uh, in Calvino's Invisible City uh, when the the Khan with whom uh, Marco Polo talks uh, in the book uh, tells him that there is a city you never mention. And this city is Venice. And, uh, and Marco Polo says, absolutely not. Venice is everywhere in my, in my stories. Everywhere, I s when I I'm talking of every single city, I'm talking about Venice. Oh. So uh, what does that mean? Very because, I mean, it, that's it, an interesting it, thing. Because when I think of the uh, South Asian, Southeast Asian kind of template, every city yes. is Ayodhya. You know, Ayodhya is this uh, kind of template city, uh, yes. which... No, he means that every, every city has, uh, t tells, him some, tells him something about Venice, about the articulation of, of, of about the morphology of Venice, about the morphology of uh, the relationship between land and water, the relationship between a square and street, the uh, uh, relation relationship between monument and fabric. So that every city, in a way, uh, is, is adding something to a portrait of Venice. Mm -hmm. So how do you sort of uh, uh, parse this conversation, this, this uh, sort of uh, theory, into the modernist claims of uh, tabula rasa? I mean, not tabula rasa. I think it's tabula rasa is a bad, bad word, but just certainly a kind of, at least some kind of a determined break with the kind of organic development of history, right? Uh, I, I don't think one should blame and put, one should put all the blame on the architects in terms of this idea of the uh, tabula rasa. The, the project of a tabula rasa is the project of capitalism. And what read, do you mean? Uh, read Karl, you read Karl Marx's manifesto of 1848. Uh, where he says that all the sacred values of the past have been trampled upon by capitalism. Mm -hmm. the, the capitalist modernization of city wants to get to get rid of the old uh, features of the uh, of historic cities to make money to make a new uh, type of developments. Uh, the social democrats subscribe to this program uh, in the name of hygiene and in the name of uh, creation of healthy workers' housing. So there is a general thrust of society. I'm just saying here that the architects, the, the modern architects and planners were just more ra a, a radical wing of a comprehensive movement which was rooted in society. No one, and uh, except some really uh, very, very, uh, what I would say, uh, isolated uh, prophets was fighting to keep the fabric of all cities in the 1920s in Europe. No one. People were uh, fighting to preserve a church or to preserve a piece of uh, maybe an old mansion, but there was no one who was supporting the idea of keeping uh, the old fabric. The old fabric was considered as aged, as unhealthy, as an embarrassment. 
So one, one, one should take out the guilt of the tabula rasa from the shoulders of yeah, the architects. The were, it's really very important to, to see things in a broader, in a broader historical perspective. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't just the European cities uh, under industrialization, but also the colonial cities uh, around the world, the black cities, the dark cities, these were all considered politically uh, in mercantile capitalism and colonialism as, uh, as places of uh, unhygiene, darkness, and uh, to be cleaned up. So uh, in a sense... To be cleaned up uh, also because they, they would, for, there were various types of motivations. Some were social, humanitarian, and others, one, others were simply... Uh, making money out of the cities. Yeah, I like this notion. I mean, you have argued elsewhere, uh, and which is, a, I think, an important idea, which I find great sympathy with, that things aren't, uh, architectural agency isn't absolute in the sense that uh, it isn't that we originate and imagine everything or that we are simply, you know, uh, carrying on the backs of uh, politics uh, and capitalism, good or bad, you know, it's a sort of a partial game, isn't it? That you, you we kind of obviously have to work with the real forces of life, uh, but we sort of insert partially, uh, architects insert a kind of a partial agency in there, which is in part written by the circumstances of production, but at this has a, only a certain amount of uh, individuality and yes. autonomy, regardless of what we claim. Here, I think uh, there is an important uh, concept uh, which has been proposed by the uh, Swiss linguist and, and, and psychologist Jean Piaget, uh, who talks about assimilation, assimilating reality, assimilating change, adjusting yourself to, uh, to, to the surrounding world. And I think uh, mo even the most radical architects, uh, the ones who wanted to uh, shake completely all the existing uh, uh, the existing culture had to assimilate what was around them. Look at Le Corbusier arriving in Rio or Algiers. He, he could not uh, simply implement the voisin plan. He had to, uh, to articulate his plan with the topography, uh, with, with particular types of fabrics. He had to take into account and assimilate, assimilate what, he, what, he, uh, what he was dealing with. The same in Chandigarh. He had to assimilate uh, some... Uh, significant aspects of Indian civilization and could not, would not have done the same plan in France or in, in Germany. So we are talking about modernism. And in a sense, if I may say, we are really talking about the mid-century modernist model. Uh, I'm, I'm really very hostile to the term mid, mid uh, sorry to say that, to mid-century. Please, please explain. For yeah, me, go ahead. No, no, for me, it's, it, it has become a sort of cliche, mid-century modernism, but it's, it's a vocabulary uh, which is used by antiquarian dealers, by dealers, yeah, yeah, yeah. by people who sell furniture. I yeah. don't think it's a scholarly concept. I don't think it's a scholarly concept. Rather than modernism, I would use the term modernity, which <laughs> has a broader cultural meaning. So modernism for me, and uh, I, I know the term is used, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty reserved because it, it has a sort of stylistic component, which yeah. doesn't... Uh, give a clear account of what were all the other dimensions of the project of modernity uh, at large, as it, as it developed in architecture and music, in art and literature, uh, uh, in society at large. So we have to be careful when, when we use this term. And again, and mid-century <laughs> is another issue. As you know, I've worked precisely on mid-century, on the middle mm -hmm. of a century, which is World War, World War II. Yeah. Uh, and here, yeah. maybe I would, I would support you by saying something happened at mid 20th century when the Second World War, this is the hypothesis of my book, Architectural Uniform, uh, when the Second World War, in a way, determined the victory of, uh, of modernity in many fields. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. resistance, resistance to new ideas was completely blasted everywhere. Yeah, uh, with the exception of a Soviet bloc, and not and only for ten years or so. Yeah, so yeah. less than ten years. So, uh, so I'm saying that uh, what we're dealing with there is a core. A, a, there is a sort of short 20th century, as opposed to the long 19th century 
which begins with Napoleon and ends with World War uh, I, basically the long 19th century of the Industrial Revolution. There is a short 20th century, which starts with World War I and ends in the 60s uh, with the crisis of, uh, of, a modern, of, a, of, a, of a discourse of modernity, the emergence of skepticism, and also uh, the late impact of decolonization and of, uh, uh, of generational change. So there is a, and it's what you call uh, mid uh, century modernism is this short 20th century, and it's a cycle. And you know it if you look at the career at the, at the big creators of modern architecture, more or less it coincides with this moment. They start before 1914, uh, we're in, in relationship with uh, Behrens or Berlach, uh, with uh, uh, the old guys who, or Sullivan, the old guys who mm -hmm. were there before, and it's and they more or less draw their trajectory to the 60s, and then they vanish. Right, they right. all vanish. So yeah. I mean, you, it's a cycle of let's say um, uh, 40 years, some yeah. some 40 years. So 40 years of the short 20th century modernity. I couldn't agree with you more that mid-century modernism is very much a capitalist uh, furniture selling uh, construct, <laughs> if you like. Uh, but we don't need to spend too much time on, on that. So, uh -huh. but, but, I, but I'm interested in, 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 in you continuing this. So there's this critique, uh, you know, late post-colonial, decolonial critiques, uh, and other kinds of critiques from the 60s and late 60s and 70s, some people would argue that uh, that modernity is still an ongoing event in the 21st century. Okay, Others yes. would, uh, where, where, where do you think, you know, so is that, are we still in that critique moment of the 70s, 80s uh, playing out or have we shifted to something else today? As you know, uh, Jürgen Habermas, the German philosopher, yeah, uh, okay. spoke about yeah. the incomplete project of modernity. And he understood it not in a stylistic manner, not in a linguistic manner. He had in mind the process of modernization. Yeah. And I think, he, I think he's right, the project of uh, social if, and uh, it's particularly important to say that when we see uh, uh, the manners uh, uh, which is now hovering over Afghanistan, the balance mm -hmm. of a major social and cultural regression these days, these very days, as we speak in mid-August uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think a project of, uh, of modernity, the, uh, the, the creation of a culture uh, based on, on creative freedom, on the subversion of the existing codes, uh, on the search for new a new convergence between science and uh, uh, the arts and culture. I don't think that's, that this is obsolete. Uh, I think that we, we now see that the so-called postmodernism post was not an overwhelming and uh, irreversible condition, but simply a season. It was mm. a moment mm. of reaction mm -hmm. uh, in front of the, uh, what I would say, the where uh, of the um, of a certain of, of a certain type of productions in front of the aging of a generation of founders, so it was a very understandable gen uh, response carried by a generation, and uh, uh, generations today have a different perspective, including aesthetically, aesthetically uh, returning to a series of ideas of. Uh, of modernity, also by the way, recycling postmodernism as a sort of uh, 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 decorative language, with uh, uh, but with a critical perspective, not mm -hmm. in a sort of ironic perspective. So I think things have become much more, much more complex. And here, uh, I think once one of the uh, concepts uh, one should apply to the unfolding of the architectural discourse as well as in other uh, fields. Uh, and this is something I've tried to do in a little uh, book, which uh, might be published one of, one, of, one of these days, uh, is the concept of generation, which is often used by sociology and history. What is a, what is a generation? A generation is defined by co shared experience, by common goals, by common uh, enemies, uh, by uh, an attitude. So we've seen, uh, it, it will be interesting to really work 
at the generations which on the generations which have shaped architecture since the late 19th century. I've tried to do that. The architects who were interested in the emergence of new materials and urban, the uh, sort of irresistible urban growth before 1914, the generation completely shaped by the, uh, by the uh, destructions and the slaughter of uh, World War I, which for instance made what Weimar G Germany became, what uh, 1920s Russia became, and mm. et cetera. And uh, the generation of 68, uh, kids who were brought up in the in the long shadow cast by the Second World War and who wanted to have a, a fairly different agenda. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we have to uh, if we, we have to start looking at this layering of uh, uh, of group age in a particular uh, in a more precise manner. And we'll see that every generation has a sort of uh, as an expectation. A horizon of expectation in respect to what the world should become, and also have a, a concrete experience which sometimes is contradictory with this horizon. So mm -hmm. it might yeah, be a sure. little abstract, but, but no, I, no. I, I, think we have, I, I think we have to be more flexible in using representations about the adjustment of people to time and, and, their, and their response. Here I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sh challenge uh, what the discourse which is called architectural history, uh, a term I also dislike. I might be talking too much about uh, the words, about the terms we use to uh, to describe our own work or our, our own discipline, if there is a discipline there. Uh, I don't think there is anything that can be called architectural history. Uh, architectural history for me, uh, what I understand uh, when I hear architectural history is a sort of history which is subservient to the architectural profession, to the expectations of the architectural world in which it mm -hmm. is inscribed. I'm much more interested in history dealing with architecture, of history mm -hmm. applied and using architecture as a phenomenological field for analyzing how things change. So I think we, ha we should be careful about this, uh, this term or maybe we can use it, but uh, knowing that it, what its limits and its implications are. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I also uh, try and look at architecture as a test case for talking about processes of, if you like, culture and, uh, and, and the larger worlding of the world. But let me return to the earlier uh, contention about generations. And certainly one can see, as you articulated in the you know, 60s, 70s, uh, even 80s, that uh, there was a kind of a generational response, to, uh, you know, the era of, of the big figures in modernism and a sort of a kind of a, a big picture uh, worldview. So then for by we are in the next generation today, yeah? I mean, from the 90s onwards, roughly from, I don't know, let's say from the fall of uh, Berlin, wall of Berlin Wall, yes. yeah, end of the Cold War, yes. So you wouldn't argue in the terms of the larger history of the world that with the global economy and now with this sort of significantly looming project of, of the climate crisis, that we are in a significantly different stage of uh, life? Absolutely. I think there are many signs that show that uh, not only, I mean, if we look at uh, what we can um, uh, very narrowly, and this is what you demonstrate in the uh, splendid uh, volume you have uh, edited with Maristella Cachato, see that our discipline is way, way more diverse uh, and is uh, uh, able at uh, looking in a comprehensive manner at a wide spectrum of experiences which were outside of the uh, of the accepted discourse. So there is a, an awareness of much wider internationalization of the uh, I wouldn't say globalization, but inter internationalization of the of culture, which at the same time at the same time as some aspect that can be perceived as frightening, and you have also some uh, neo nationalists which are uh, which are rather disturbing. Yes. And, 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 yeah. At, at the political level, you're, of course, aware of uh, more than I am of what uh, happens with Mr. Modi uh, in, uh, in India, for instance. Well, Mr. Extreme. Modi, Mr. Trump, Mr. so on. Mr. Trump, so Mr. Orban many. in Hungary, all yeah. the way. And, and we see how history can be really a battlefield. I mean, the uh, policy of uh, Putin to uh, completely domesticate history 
uh, which is taking place these days, mm -hmm. uh, the creation of sort of uh, neo-Stalinist discourse uh, in Russia and the repression against dissidents in the uh, historical discipline is extremely worrisome. So we are we are in a in a in a very exciting and also very threatening. Uh, contact today with, I think, young, young scholars, young professionals who are more internationalized than ever, ever. Look at the mobility of professionals from the last maybe two generations. It's not only this phenomenon can be seen at the level of a so-called uh, most famous uh, uh, architects. I, another term I hate is uh, star architects, so I won't use it, but at the level of these uh, architects who are the, I uh, would say, the haute couture of the profession, uh, it has been happening not, not only in the last decades. It started when precisely Le Corbusier, or even before Le Corbusier, the uh, Beaux-Arts bosses were invited to uh, Brazil or Argentina in the early 20th century. So it's an old phenomenon. What is new is that uh, it much more modest, I would say, or younger professionals are engaged in a sort of very mobile, uh, very mobile system today. And mm -hmm. uh, architects coming from uh, regions uh, which we now call uh, in American universities the global, the global South are invited to work in, in the North. This is, I, and I think that this is really important phenomenon which ne had never existed probably it started only around 1939 when Oscar Niemeyer was invited to build the Brazilian pavilion in, at the New York Fair. Right. I'm an architect from a previously colonized a nation, knowing also mm -hmm. that the U.S. Were pre had been previously colonized, but that an architect from a previously co colonized nation was making a big statement in the North. So it's at the scale of human history, it's very, it's, uh, it's like yesterday. But today, I think this uh, international condition, uh, this transnational condition, the existence of offices which are operate, uh, operating in many places, and not only, again, the, 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 top, the top 20 is something really, really different. The idea that uh, architectural expertise can be shared widely is, is, an, interesting, is an interesting one, combined also with, uh, with reactions, with counter movements. So as we start moving towards the end here, uh, how would you distinguish this kind of, let's say, internationalization with the kind of a something of a, let's say, decolonial component from uh, ideas of the genericity? Uh, this kind of proliferation of a kind of a, uh, I don't know, would it, you call it uh, negatively cut-paste architecture or positively transparent aspirational architectures and cities? Uh, uh, well, I don't know. Again, we have to, this has to do with the, I, I, would, um, I would return to, uh, uh, to Karl Marx and the idea that uh, sacred values are all uh, the virtue, virtues and great ideas are drawn his term has drawn in the icy waters uh, of uh, uh, profit-oriented uh, egoism of capitalism. I would say that the norms of spatial transformation have been, have been defined by market-oriented capitalism almost everywhere. This is the way previously uh, so-called socialist countries have, uh, have transformed. This is the way previous colonized countries have, uh, have been transformed, the exceptions. The only exceptions, in a way, are either uh, countries which, which remain still outside of the world markets or countries in which we, you have an extremely strong preservation establishment and, and very, very solid planning culture. But even there, even there, I'm taking the case of Holland, where, where, I, uh, where I spend a lot of time, the same, the same is uh, the same is true everywhere. So we, we are having, we're facing an uh, irresistible thrust of uh, capitalism and the market, and in which uh, some islands of specificity can sometimes be kept for, of course, in relationship with tourism, uh, with tourism and leisure. Of course. Yeah. Also, when identity and historicity becomes profitable, it is maintained. Uh, and in very few cases, when you have a local alliance between uh, well-intentioned uh, uh, rulers and uh, and uh, distinguished uh, uh, professionals uh, 
uh, and designers. So I think we are living in this world where also, which uh, is uh, different from the previous world because uh, uh, again, I would, yeah, as, as you know, the Marxists insisted very much on the contradiction between town and country. This was, mm -hmm. by the way, more Engels than Marx. Mm -hmm. uh, that it was one of the signs of capitalism. But today, the sign of capitalism is uh, probably the disappearance of the, of the country, which is becoming a worldwide uh, suburbia, uh, even if agriculture continues to operate and if there is a sudden return to, to agriculture. So this basic difference, which was in a way, the prophecy of the third third landscape, which had been made by Ebenezer Howard between mm -hmm. town, and, town, and, town and country, has taken an unexpected form in which the idea of Howard and others, the progressive ideas, have been completely uh, instrumentalized in, in, in the best cases or forgotten in the worst. Right. What would you th what do you say about the sense of crisis? You know, I mean particularly with the climate and all these rise of neo-nationalisms today. Uh, would you say, well, we've been through this many times before. Certainly there was a strong sense of crisis in the late 19th century, major crises in the 20th century. And, you know, this is the condition of modernity, one of its parameters. Uh, uh, or, uh, or do you think uh, there is something specific about our newest thinking about this? Uh, well, it's clear that we are facing crisis which has no precedent. It, we're, uh, of course, the destruction of the countryside by, by industry started in England, in the, or France, uh, in the developed countries of Europe in the in the nineteenth century. This, but this was at a completely different scale: the scale of destruction of uh, of natural landscape, the scale of destruction of cultural la cultural landscape, which was disappearing, uh, the uh, threat in terms of uh, brutal, brutal change of living conditions is unprecedented. And again, it's not a matter that design, the forces of good design can have a role, can point to some partial solutions, can uh, deal with the rising water levels, with creative techniques, can deal with uh, the rise of temperatures also with other types of, uh, other types of buildings, can... Uh, uh, these device low energy solutions, but they can't, they clearly can't stop the, the movement by themselves. So what, yeah, yeah. what we need is in a way at, at, a, at, a, at a totally new scale to recreate the alliance which made the best projects of modernity possible, which were alliances between political rulers and designers uh, have in mind uh, the municipality of Frankfurt and Ernst Main in the 1920s. I have in mind Nehru and uh, uh, Le Corbusier uh, in, in Chandigarh. I have in mind some uh, the uh, municipality of Barcelona and uh, the new generations of architects in Spain and Europe in the 1980s and 90s. What happened also in Berlin at the time of the IBA and uh, this, uh, sometimes uh, more recently. So I think we, there is, we need a new scale of interaction and of uh, joint reflection and collaboration between uh, political forces and cultural forces. Otherwise, the cultural forces will make very uh, brilliant, very brilliant, very subversive, very promising statements, which will remain s very small islands in an ocean of uh, horror. Well, Jean, with that hope and fear, <laughs> uh, with the idea of, uh, uh, we have to have another big discussion on patrons and architects, which I know is a topic you work extensively on also, but uh, which I have also great interest in, and what makes for a good patronage and what are good collaborations with political and uh, uh, other kinds of leaders and designer architectural agencies is, is a great topic. But we leave that for the next, next conversation. Uh, but I thank you for recording this with me and for sharing your thoughts on the long 200 years. We started in the late 18th century with your ancestors moving from Kassim, from, from <laughs> north, from to, 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 to Morocco to, 
Paris and we have ended with, uh, with our contemporary times. Thank you very much, Jean-Louis. Jean My pleasure, Yavik I'm very happy to have shared these uh, uh, perhaps too vague thoughts with you. And uh, see you no. soon. See you soon. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Amelia Jarvanen. We hope you enjoyed the conversation, and if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk. <laughs>